I asked the praise team, if y'all could reach back and just pull an old song this morning as a tribute to this generation that provided for the pews you sitting on and the roof that's over our head and the sound system that we speaking through for you to hear us and these instruments on this stage. Somebody's got to lay the foundation. And um, since I met Jesus, there's been a burning. So after this song, we're going to go into the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. Amen. Oh, yeah. Is easy. His yoke 
is easy. His yoke is easy. Oh, and his burdens are light. Thank you, thank you, choir. Thank you, choir. It is very clear to me that these ladies and Johnny came to sing today. Won't you join me in thanking them for letting God use them to bring us to the throne of God. <laughs> I don't know if the term on point is okay, but that's what I feel like saying. They were on point. Amen. There is no other way. I want you to bow your head with me. Turn to everlasting God. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart now be made acceptable in your sight. Oh God, you are our strength and our redeemer. So let your word go forth. Never ever to come back boy, avoid, but accomplish the purpose for which it is sent. Comfort the disturbed, dear Lord, in your word. Disturb the comfortable in your word. But remind us once and again that your word is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believeth. For faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. How can people believe on what they have not heard? How can they hear except someone proclaim it? But how can we make such proclamation unless you send us? So right now, God, in your Holy Spirit, let us release this word into the hearts and minds of your people that they be edified and God, you be glorified. 
and we would be careful to give you alone the praise and the glory and the honor. In the name of Christ, we pray, and God, we give you thanks. Let us say amen. As you stand with me so that we can turn in our scriptures to the first chapter of Paul's first epistle to Timothy, let's show some love for the band, too. Don't forget the band. Don't forget the band. Amen. We thank God for the band and also the media service because we talk services. We talk about faith coming by hearing. The only reason why you can hear me right now is because media services is on point too. So oftentimes we don't mention media services unless something goes wrong. Amen. So we want to recognize that when ain't nothing wrong, everything is right. And it ain't just Kevin, it's the whole team. Say amen, Phil. Amen. <laughs> amen. I want to read for your hearing the 12th through the 17th verses of First Timothy, the 12th through the 17th verses. I'm reading from the NIV. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service, even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man. I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Scripture as it is written, it is always our prayer that God will bless us in the reading and the hearing of his most holy word. You may be seated in the presence of God and each other. And those of you out in the digisphere, you may tilt back, kick back, sit back. On the presence of God and whoever else's presence you may happen uh, to be with. I want to tag this text with the title, The Importance and the Power of an Appropriate Testimony. That's a lot of words, but the importance and the power of an appropriate testimony. Church is changing, the world is changing, and some of the changes are good. Some of them may not be so good. Time will tell. One of the changes is the almost extinction of the old time testimony service. Having grown up in a historic church in Bethlehem Baptist Church at Tacoma, Washington, founded 1890, I grew up among people who uh, practiced that old time religion, at least from a black Baptist perspective. And one of the things that that involved was testimony service. Not on Sunday morning, because Sunday morning is kind of timed out tight and right. You lean it down, you cut out the fat. And, uh, but night service and revival meetings and watch night on New Year's Eve always featured the testimony service where the talking went from the pulpit to the pew. And, 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 and there, were, there were protocols back then when they did the old uh, testimony service. Um, I could hear the old deacons, sometimes they would, they had a way of tying it together so that the service didn't seem flat, so they moved it along with music. I believe I'll testify while I have the chance, oh, I believe I'll testify while I have the chance, whoa, I believe I'll testify. While I have the chance, cause I may not have the chance anymore. And, and, and the span of the song was the time for another saint to stand up, and perhaps adjust their trousers or their skirt and get into position 
to stand up and give their testimony. And there were clear protocols back then. We had rules for everything, and you had to enter and exit your testimony appropriately. And the protocol said you had to stand up, and first you had to give honor to God, to the pastor, pastor, first lady, ministers on the roster, to the deacons, officers, members, and friends. You had to do the checklist, show that you came from good stock. Then you'd go on and give your testimony. But, you know, you had to mount, you had to do the dismount too. Before you sat down, you had to say, you had two options. You could say, uh, pray my strength in the Lord, or y'all pray for me and I'll pray for you. And when you sat down, then they started back in. I believe I testify. While I had the chance, and then the next person, they would fight to see who's going to get in the water next. It's like double dutch, whoever jumped in next. But those kind of testimony services have evaporated in the modern church for a couple of different reasons. Number one, because we stopped having night service. Revivals and other kinds of meetings, and primarily had to do with demographics. Back in the days of redlining, which forced us as a people to all live close to our houses of worship. We couldn't live just anywhere. We lived in certain districts, and the church house was usually down the street from a lot of folks who walked to church back then. It was that close. And so you could have Sunday morning service, go home, get some dinner, come back for night service. But once folks started moving out into other areas, when folks moved out of the central district into other areas, moved out of the hilltop into other areas, in Buffalo, New York, moved out of the Ellicott district into Amherst, into other areas, once they left on Sunday morning, you wasn't going to see them till the next Sunday morning because they wasn't going to make that long pilgrimage uh, more than once in the same day. And so night service became a victim of, of new housing patterns and demographics. But even for those communities, there were folks lived close enough that you could get some critical mass and come back for evening service. Testimony service also went away because uh, some people testified inappropriately. See, an appropriate testimony is supposed to be for the inappropriate slice of the testifier's life that is intended to be disclosed for the benefit of the hearers of the testimony. It's not for the testifier to just get up and scratch their personal itch. Beverly is for the benefit. What can I say about me and what the Lord has done in my life? Because the intent of the testimony, like the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, make known his deeds among the people. Perhaps you're struggling with what God might do in your life, and you need to know what he's done in my life as an indication of what may be possible in your life. So I testify with your needs in mind, but sometimes people testified inappropriately. I remember a service once where a young woman, beautiful young woman, curvy, stood up and gave her testimony about how she struggled with sexual addiction. And she was still praying that God would deliver her, but she kept backsliding and she was struggling. And while the words were coming out of her mouth, you could see the wheels turning in some of the brethren's minds who when service was over there was there was an unofficial receiving line of male worshipers who felt compelled to tell her how moved they were by her testimony and how available they could be for prayer if she needed a prayer partner Inappropriate testimonies like that made pastors start rethinking giving certain folk the microphone because certain testimonies were inappropriate. Now, an older woman saying something like that uh, after she's been delivered might say it to a younger woman or an older man to a younger man in private. But everything ain't for everybody to hear in certain settings. Somebody say amen. But also, they, they, they had to stop doing testimony service because we learned that painfully you can't give the mic to just everybody because it seems that there's more and more people nowadays that are loosely latched. <laughs> loosely latched. You can't give the microphone to just anybody. A colleague of mine told me a couple of years, several years ago, he stopped his, his night service because too many of the testimonies were an indication that more and more saints need medication. He said, we talking about church people playing crazy. He said, he found out these people, they ain't playing. They ain't. 
Enough was enough when a saint, when a woman stood up and said, saints of God, the Lord, put it on my heart to tell you tonight, Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. A peck of pickled peppers. Old Peter Piper picked. Well, if Brother Peter Piper all by himself picked a whole peck of pickled peppers, the Lord has sent me here tonight to ask the question, where are the peck of pickled peppers that Brother Peter Piper picked? And when the deacon went to grab the mic from her, realizing this thing had gone south, she pulled back. She said, no, no, I need an answer to the question. So testimony service became the victim of demographics, impropriety, and mental health disorders, which said to the church, maybe it's not so wise to give the mic to just anybody. But I come to tell you that despite the challenges of, of the church not being exposed to the wrong thing, there is still the need for and the benefit of a relevant and powerful testimony. That's the case of what's happening here in Paul's first of two epistles written to the young preacher, Timothy, whose family Paul has known now for three generations, going back to his grandmama Lois, his, his, his mother Eunice, and now he sees the gospel has taken root in this young man's life. But while the young man is saved and been called to the ministry, he's struggling. He's struggling with some things that in his mind, internally, he has some anxieties that cause him to question his worthiness. Not only for, for the call to ministry, but just his wondering whether or not I'm even really saved at times. Have you ever had things haunt you from the inside? To wonder if you're worthy God's call, God's purpose on your life, God's goodness on your life. This young preacher saved and preaching but still haunted on some things on the inside that had him questioning his worthiness. And, and now when we look at, 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 at Timothy, the, 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 the basis of four principal things. Number one, he was timid in his personality. He was a, a shyer sort of person, and, and ministry being what it is, putting, uh, being so public, so overly exposed, that was counterintuitive for Timothy, and then the timidity of his personality, he just wondered, can I do this thing? It's counterintuitive to be so exposed to open his mouth in front of others. He's the kind of person where off stage he just assumed be standing on the wall and blend into the woodwork. It wasn't such a natural fit for him to be out front. But there were some deeper issues that plagued the mind of young Timothy that had him question his worthiness. Number one, it was his, his ethnic background. You see, he was a biracial child. His mama was Jewish and his daddy was Greek. And in a race conscious society, imagine that, a race conscious society. Not completely like ours, but bigotry been around a long time. And in the bigotry of his day, there were times and places where he went in of a mixed ancestry and it became an issue because he knew how people, some people felt about some people like him. And it made him question his worthiness when he was treated kind of strange by certain people who didn't like mixed folk like him. He was also bothered by the fact that um, he had a he had a, a, he had a gastrointestinal disorder. He had a, a physical oddity, frailty, however you want to say it. I don't know if he had irritated bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, but he's, apparently he spent a lot of time in the bathroom. For which Paul prescribed in the available home remedies of the time, a little wine for the stomach, little wine. This was no Jack Daniels. This wasn't rum and Coke. This wasn't brandy this 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 was not ever clear this was not white lightning it is it is certainly wasn't mad dog 2020 this was 
this is it, it was the equivalent of a spritz or a mimosa that you have at brunch that some of y'all gonna have in a little bit. This 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 was what what this Reverend uh, uh, Dominique last week called. It was the equivalent, not much more than ginger ale and some crackers. Settle down your stomach, but he had a, a physical oddity or a frailty that made him feel deficiency. Defa made him feel deficient. But in addition to that, there was another reason closely tied to the first reason about his mixed ancestry. His mother was Jewish, his daddy was Greek, and because his daddy was Greek, his daddy did not follow through on the prescribed Jewish uh, regiment, ritual of having his male child circumcised on the eighth day. So he was uncircumcised. And that became an issue. Now Paul, Paul had said in many places that we take no pride in the flesh because flesh is flesh and the wages of flesh is death but the spirit is spirited and spirited in his life so we have no confidence in the flesh but somehow or another these people found out that this boy was uncircumcised and Paul being the pragmatist said we shouldn't put no emphasis upon the flesh um, to, to remove the issue so he could get back to the focus on the gospel he had Timothy as an adult get circumcised so that his uncircumcised condition wasn't an issue now I don't know how they, um, they knew in the first place because that seems pretty private to me I don't know what their check-in procedures were in their local synagogues I know we have our check-in procedures that you got to show proof of full vaccination you show your card we let you in so I don't know what their check-in procedures were but somehow or another they found out something very private about this boy it became public that he wasn't circumcised and Paul went to have him circumcised so at least among Jews that the the, the, the physical mark was not a cause of offense but you add it all up his timidity of personality his mixed race uh him 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 having a physical oddity or frailty and him not being circumcised, which really came down to the litmus test within the religious cult of the day. The litmus test, you know, the thing that you, the benchmark you got to get over. Circumcision is not the only litmus test we have in our houses of worship. Sometimes the litmus test was, did you grow up in church? Some people feel unworthy because they didn't grow up in church. Was your daddy a preacher? If you happen to be a preacher, have you been to seminary? Uh, you, you know, all these litmus litmus tests is in a Kojic church do you talk in tongues so we have all kinds of litmus tests that make people question themselves if we don't follow the checklist just right and Paul talking to this young man who saved and called to the ministry but got this stuff in his head questioning whether or not he was worthy he decides that he doesn't need more doctrine at this point he needs to hear a part of my testimony that's appropriate to maybe give him some sense about what to do with those things that cause you to question your worthiness within the kingdom business and the call of God. Oh, Timothy, you got some stuff that's bothering you. You a little anxious because of your, your racial mix. You a little bit anxious because of some physical frailties you have. You a little bit anxious because of the litmus test of circumcision and, and, all, and all of that. And he said, but let me tell you, I got some stuff that in the past used to cause me to question my worthiness. And specifically, what used to plague me, my past in the past was the thing that caused me to feel unworthy. Can I say that again? Paul's testimony was that in the past, his past was the thing that caused him to question his unworthiness. I don't know who I'm talking to, but sometimes in the past, his past was the thing that caused him to question if God could use even me. And so when he deconstructs, decodes, and deciphers that, he was talking about the fact that he says to, he, he gives him his testimony, a testimony, and I want to make sure you get it right, it, it moves, it progresses on this paradigm of admission, recognition, and celebration. Did you catch that? This testimony between verses 12 and 17, it moves on a progression of admission, recognition, and celebration. The admission was simple, straight to the point, cut to the chase. He says, I was a persecutor and a blasphemer of the church. Now, in several of his other letters, Johnny, he talked about the fact that he was a persecutor of the church with papers from the council of which he used to be a part. He was, he was authorized to go into people's houses, searches and seizures. He had them arrested. He had them oppressed. He had them jailed. He had them killed. He persecuted the church. But this is the first and only instance where he adds to it, I blaspheme. 
Because blasphemy, blasphemy by definition is a lie against God. And the irony here is he's, he's admitting to young Timothy, you think you got some stuff that makes you question your worthiness to be used by God? I persecuted, but also was a blasphemer. I lied on God. Now, what's notable about that statement is, is not only Paul's sense of guilt over that, but the fact that he seems at first to excuse it because he acted in ignorance. Which is not to be understood as he's dismissing. I didn't know no better than what I did. No, no, no. I knew what I did, but I didn't really know what I did. What you talking about preaching? You remember when Jesus said from the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. One biblical writer says that what Paul is really saying here, the severity of what he did, blaspheming, lying on God. The severity of his sins that came out of that. In itself is evidence that he didn't know what he was doing. Because if he knew what he was doing, he wouldn't have been doing what he was doing. Sometimes you can know what you're doing, but you don't really know what you're doing. What are you talking about? He said, I blasphemed. I didn't know I was blaspheming. I thought that the followers of Christ before my own conversion, that they were blaspheming against the kingdom of God as it was manifested in the law of Moses. That was the understanding of the kingdom of God and of righteousness in compliance with the law. So when these people came along following this doctrine and this example of this barefoot Jew from the ghettos of Nazareth, I thought they were blaspheming against Moses. And in any religious tradition, when you are guilty of blasphemy, lying against God, you suffer the severest of consequences. So while I knew I was persecuting them, I thought I was right to persecute them because I thought they were guilty of blasphemy until I met him and when I met him and I found out that he was the way the truth and the light then I realized they weren't the ones committing blasphemy I was so while I knew what I was doing, I really didn't know what I was doing because when I was committing blasphemy, I didn't know I was committing blasphemy. If I knew then what I know now, I wouldn't have done what I did then. Mm. Let me get another window of application. There, there, there are some people who, who, who thought that Colin was being unpatriotic when he knelt down in the playing of national anthem, never stopped the playing of never anthem, never delayed the start of a football game. But somebody told them that him kneeling during the national anthem was unpatriotic act. Ain't it ironic that the same people who got outraged at him kneeling during the playing of the national anthem said he was insulting the flag, took the flag, weaponized the flag, used it to beat up the police that they said they loved and defecated on the floor of the rotunda and the citadel of our democracy urinated on the wall and while they were accusing Colin of being unpatriotic as it turns out they were being unpatriotic but they stormed the capitol believing that they were standing up for the flag standing up for the constitution because somebody told them a big lie they knew what they was doing but they really didn't know what they was doing because once they swallowed the kool-aid It's amazing how we get caught up. We know what we're doing, but we really don't know what we're doing. Oh, let me give you another application. Let me bring it closer to home. There are people who grew up in churches where they told certain people because of who they loved and the way they loved, they were an abomination. You quoted, you quoted uh, 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 Leviticus 18 and Deuteronomy 20 that they were an abomination to God and didn't realize that you were saying it in the house of the Savior who said, by this they'll know you're my disciples, that you love one another. And the very loveless, hateful, malicious act of disqualifying someone's entire humanity because of your flawed hermeneutical strategy that was the abomination so while you were calling them an abomination the very act of calling them an abomination that was the abomination you didn't even know what you were doing when you were doing what you were doing when I think of all the sermons that I wish I could take back that I preached in the dawning of my public ministry I knew what I was saying but I really didn't know what I was saying till I knew what I was saying and I wonder how many people got hurt because they had a preacher up there who didn't know what he was doing, but didn't know that he didn't know that he was doing what he was doing. Committing blasphemy, didn't know you was committing blasphemy too. You really understood what blasphemy was. And Paul says for that, I am chief of sinner because the worst thing according to the code, the Pharisaic code, was blasphemy to lie on God. He was lying on God, didn't know he was lying on God till he knew the truth. And then he said, I am chief of sinners because I'm the one who committed blasphemy. And blasphemy is the worst thing you can do according to the code. I am chief of sinners. That's the admission. 
Oh, Timothy, you got you questioning your worthiness because of your mixed race or your timidity of personality or you didn't have the litmus test of of circumcision uh, um, um, or you got a physical frailty or oddity. Let me tell you, something. I had some stuff. My past in the past is the thing that caused me to question my unworthiness because I am chief of sinners. But the story didn't stop there. He said, but. I, though while I'm chief of sinners, he says, the Lord poured out God's abundant grace on me. Now, don't rush past that. Do we not understand? Paul, the Apostle Paul is the only person who added the word grace to the Christian vocabulary. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The word grace don't fit up in there. No, 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 no. In, in Luke, he says, let us make merry and be glad for that which was lost is now found. That which was dead is alive again. But you don't see the word grace. In John, you hear the seven I am sayings. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection. I am the door. I am the straight gate. I am the resurrection and the life. But you don't hear the word grace there. Sharis, unmerited favor. Paul is the one who adds the word grace. Ephesians 2, 8, and 2, 2nd chapter 8 through 10th grade. For by grace are we saved. For by grace are we saved through faith, not of our works, nor of ourselves. It is the gift of God. By grace, God's unmerited favor he says that I who am chief of sinners he says that God met my mess by pouring out not trickling not sprinkling his God's uh, overflowing some traditions say overflowing grace upon me that's why I like the, the the baptism by immersion I know you can do it by sprinkling and other traditions but I think on the optics when you look at it when you are immersed, whether in a river, in a lake, or in the pool, when you just look at it on the mere optics alone, that when you are lowered in the water, that's, that's symbolic of your sinful past, uh, and, and the water symbolic of God's grace, there's more water than there is you, and you begin to see that God's got more grace than you got mess. That's the whole message there. God's got more grace than you got mess. No matter how much mess you got, God's got more grace. When you sprinkle, there's more you than there is water. That's why I like to dip them in the pool because no matter how much mess you got there's more water than there is mess and Paul saying my life was messy a lot more messy than yours Timothy but guy was met with the overflowing grace of God I needed the overflowing not just the grace but I needed grace that poured I pour you out of bless that poured in other words God gave me more grace than what I need it was overflowing uh, let me give you a window of application. Years ago, when I was a uh, teenager, Marla met me, my brother Norman, his friend Horace Lee, um, all who lived right around the perimeter of Peck Field in Tacoma. We had been at Franklin Park. We had been exercising, training. Norman and I played football. Horace Lee played basketball at Wilson. And we were walking hot summer day. And then right there on 15th and State Street. You know where I'm at? 15th and State Street. Mr. Volley lived there. And Mr. Volley Miss Johnson lived right there on that side of Peck Field. We lived right around here on 1242 South Ferry Street. But right there, we were coming home and we were soaked through our clothes we had been running exercise a hot summer day Mr. Volley was out there with his holes watering the little flowers that punctuated his, uh, the, his, his sidewalk and he had it on a little gentle stream because when you when you're watering your little flowers you don't want too much force behind it because you tear up the flowers and so he lived watering his flowers and we said Mr. Volley Mr. Volley said gentlemen he said Mr. Volley can we get a drink of water he said, sure, and he raised the hose. Back then, we drank from hoses. Can, can I get some old school folk who drank from hoses and was grateful? Did nothing look better than a, than a hose, a water hose. We snuck into people's yards and drank from strangers' hoses, and they all had lead pipes back then. That was back in the day when you went in somebody's house and you came in, they asked you if you would like a glass of water. They didn't give you no bottle. They went to the, they went to the cab and they pulled out a glass and, and they, went to the, they went right to the, to the faucet and ran some water. They might or might not have some ice and they handed it to you and you drank it. You said that was so refreshing. That's when people drank, drank tap water back then and used to make jokes. Shoot, somebody in the future going to try to make us pay for some water. Stop playing, man. Ain't nobody going to pay for no water. 
And he gave us that hose, and we were trying, we were so thirsty, we were trying to drink from that hose, Dennis. And, and yet, but, 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 but we could barely get anything out of that. Mr. Volley came and said, Let me get, get, give me the hose back. We said, Mr. Volley, we, 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 we haven't gotten much water yet. He said, But hold on, I'm gonna give it back. But hold on, he went back to the faucet. He said, Thirsty as you fellas are, he said, Y'all need the full flow. And that's what Paul is saying here. He says, as deep as my sins were, I not only needed grace, I needed the full flow. And I wonder if there's three, four people in here who know that the stuff you were into, you needed the full flow, not a sprinkle. Maybe your stuff didn't go out there in public like the coach of the Boston Celtics, but you and God know you've been some places just as bad. You parked your car in some driveways that had no business being in or allowed somebody to park their car in your driveway. You've smoked some stuff. You've drank some stuff. You've turned some deals. You've cheated. You've done this. Don't nobody know about it. God knows about it. And the only reason why you're here today as well off as you are is because God turned the full flow of grace the full flow that's the recognition the admission is I'm chief of sinners the recognition is that I was the benefit of the full flow of grace and he says to Timothy you caught up and worried about your mixed race and your physical frailties oddity and your litmus test of circumstance he said listen this is a, a worthy statement and, and worthy of your full embrace. In other words, you can take this to the bank. He said, Jesus Christ came to save sinners, of which I am the worst. But he said, but that's the very reason why he saved me. And then he repeats it, I am the worst. Did I tell you I am the worst? Timothy, did I tell you I am the worst? Yes, I am the worst. But he showed me mercy so that by me, that as an example, that he would use me as an example to show the unlimited patience that God has for others who might believe. Because there's other people wondering out there, even me, Lord, can you save even me? Can you forgive even my sins? I, he wants you to know there is no blood sin his blood cannot cover there is no hurt his bomb cannot heal there's no situation so complex that the Lord can't fix it if you bring it to them Paul said if God could fix me if God could save me if God could cleanse me And then Paul, who does this admission, this appropriate admission to this young man who's, who's anxious about his, his sense of unworthiness and follows it up with the good news, the recognition of the full flowing grace. And no matter how messy your life has been, there's more grace than you got mess. He, Paul then, right in the middle of his testimony, he goes into doxology, which normally comes at the end. It's kind of a capstone on a book or a chapter or something. Uh, uh, it's, it's an ascent into high praise. But P P Paul gets, get, gets, gets, he gets excited here and his pen does his shouting for him. Right as he talks about that, that God has saved him and did it for the reason to use his life as an example uh, to anyone else who might believe that the grace of God is sufficient for whatever it is that's bothering you. He said to the eternal king. The invisible, the immortal, the positive, well, just the only God. To him be glory, majesty forever and ever. In other words, when you start thinking, you start thinking. In Jude, you see Jude pick this thing up. He says, now unto him who's able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior. To God be our glory, majesty, dominion, and power now and forever. Paul said in Romans in the 11th chapter, in the 34th verse, he said, who has known the mind of God? Who has been God's counselor? Who has given God anything that God might have to repay them? For everything is from God, through God, for God. So to God be the glory now and forever and ever and ever why every God be the glory because God is the only one who has that fountain of overflowing grace that suits your case he is the only one why do I call him the eternal king because when I was chief of sins he met my sinfulness and outmatched it with his grace and so the God who saved me despite everything I've done to him be our glory majesty and forever now and forever now forever and ever and ever and ever 
I will praise this God with this overflowing fountain. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. A dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And now there may I, the vile as he, lose all my guilty stains. That's what Paul was saying to Timothy. You think you got some stuff that might disqualify you, but the sins you've committed, the stuff that troubles you, don't even compare to the strikes that God had against me. I was the chief of sinners, but my sin was no match for his grace, his amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. You can take this to the bank, Timothy, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners just like you and just like me. Jesus Christ came into the world to save drunkards just like you and just like me. Jesus Christ came into the world to save adulterers and fornicators just like you and just like me. Jesus Christ came into the world to save liars and backstabbers just like you and just like me because I'm just a nobody. I'm trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. In fact, when I think about his goodness and all he's done for me, my soul cries out, now unto the eternal king, immortal, invincible, the only God forever and ever. If I had a thousand tongues, I couldn't thank you enough. Have I got a witness? I just came here to tell God thank you for your grace and your mercy. Have I got a witness? Thank you that my sins did not have the last word, but your grace. Have I got a witness? I dare three, four people in the house right now. Look at somebody close to you. Pull your mask down if you have to and tell them, baby, whatever you got, he can fix it. His grace can fix it. If you really believe that, open your mouth and give God some praise. Say yeah. Say yeah. Hey, hey, hey. Thank you for being a heart fixer. Thank you for being a mind regulator. Thank you for making, being a bridge over troubled waters. Thank you for looking beyond my faults and seeing my needs. See, yeah, 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 yeah. The power of an appropriate testimony. <sighs> you may not tell everybody everything, but there's somebody out there struggling, wondering what possibility is there for their life because of their gang activity, their, their teenage pregnancy, their their felony record, their history of being abused or abused. And it shouldn't be a secret what God has done. The redeemed of the Lord need to come along to young people and you need to say something to somebody. You wrapped real tight and right today. Some things you never repented of, you just got old. You didn't let go of it, it left you. No, you ain't shutting the club down no more because you got to be asleep and take your medication by 10. But there's a time you left with the janitor. The sun was up already when you left. Woke up some places you didn't know where you was. Besides some people whose name you didn't know. Come on, somebody. Look at your neighbor and say, Reb's all up in your business now. Somebody 
who's struggling with their stuff needs to know your life is an example. God got more grace than you got mess. Y'all sing something. Somebody out there in the digits fear, I need you to hit that button. How do I become a member? Somebody out there wondering, struggling, even me, even me, my family don't talk to me. Neighbors are scared of me. That may be. But God is always ready to start over. The God who has this overflowing grace is always ready to start over. If you just come as you are. This is a good accept, statement, ready, worthy of your full embrace. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, even the chief of sinners. That means he's waiting for you. Whosoever will, whether in the digisphere or in here, you can come. Whosoever will. Today can be the first day of the rest of your life, of your best life, if you just come as you are. Whosoever will. Come on, everybody. Create in me. A clean heart. Purify me. Whosoever will. Whosoever will. If you don't have a church home, come on. You can be part of our church family. We are all imperfect. Works under construction. We got room for one more broken, imperfect person trying with God's help to get it together and keep it together. Come on, join the family. We ain't perfect, but we are persuaded. Nothing will separate us from the love of God. A clean Purify me. Ah, oh, bless the Lord. Whosoever will. Hit that button. How do I become a member if you're in the digisphere? If you're in here, step out of that aisle and extend to us your hand and fellowship as you extend to God your heart and faith. One more time, create. What do you want? What do you want God to do? A clean heart, then I can you say it one more time? Create a clean heart, purify. Come on, church, put your hands together and praise the eternal king, the invisible, the immortal, the only God.